finally, leaders at the G20 summit in Rome are expected to commit to reducing the time needed to develop and deploy COVID-19 vaccines. A draft statement says that they support that they support rather to cut that time from 300 days to just 100. The statement is still subject, of course, to last many changes, but the vaccine commitment that is expected to remain. That's a run through your headlines. Now, COP26, of course, is going to be dominating headlines for the next week or so. So let's focus on that. African countries are expected to request rich nations to honor and deepen their pledges to fund the fight against climate change. This comes amidst the COP26 summit scheduled to be held in Glasgow over in Scotland from Sunday. Organizers have warned that the chances of averting runaway climate change are dwindling. While the nations are set to focus on cuts in carbon emissions to try and restrict global warming to just 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. But African countries are facing financial challenges in curbing emissions and also adapting to the wrenching impact of climate change. Today, this promise has become obsolete. It is no longer relevant. And yet developed countries are still unable to mobilize the funds. Our view now is that we need to go much further. It is not the maximum goal under the Paris Agreement because the agreement says $100 billion is a minimum. All right, then let's explore exactly what African countries should expect once the COP26 summit does get underway. Londrin Indret is the regional director of 350.org. He's joining us now from Uppsala over in Sweden. Um, thank you for your time this evening. So developed countries really did not deliver on that pledge to provide $100 billion in adaptation financing a year. And it's not the only thing they've lied about. Um, when it comes to equity and distribution of vaccines, we're essentially seeing them hoarding hundreds of millions of doses as well. So going into COP26, why should African countries take any future promises of funding seriously? Yeah, there are very um, evident reason to doubt about uh, uh, the promises or the pledges uh, made by wealthy nations. Because um, if you remember correctly, the some pledges have been made uh, uh, before, uh, starting from the Copenhagen summit, where um, 100 billion per year were promised. But as we know, wealthy countries uh, failed to deliver uh, the promise, um, um, yeah, the promised sums, and also some of the uh, commitment that were part of um, uh, the Paris Agreement are also yet to be materialized. I think. The COP26 in, in Glasgow is an opportunity for uh, wealthy countries to seriously mend uh, their ways and begin to pay uh, the climate debt in terms of adaptation and reparation. I think um, the moment is not, uh, uh, is, is not about making new pledges or commitment, but rather increasing and fulfilling the previous pledges because uh, the situation can't wait. If you look at the uh, um, the drought situation in northern part of, of Kenya, in, you know, the, the, the region of Masrabit and Wanjir, and you go to Madagascar, you find millions of people to the, who are at the moment in the brink of, of famine uh, who can't um, get, um, can put food on the table. So this is such a situation which really can't, can't wait and which require immediate um, uh, action and not for, you know, uh, future pledges or promises. But, but at the end of the day, Laundry, the fact of the matter is that if, if these countries you know, made all these fancy promises and they didn't deliver, the fact is African countries are alone in this matter. Because what, what leverage does a continent have to sit at the table and tell the G20 or the EU or the US and say, look, you guys made these promises, you need to deliver on them? I mean, th there is no leverage on the table. Uh, I understand that um, the, the, the power and the balances might not be so equal You know, when you look at the... Uh, um, global north versus the global south um, uh, power and capaci capability uh, to uh, find a, a, a right deal. But I think this is also uh, a call on the African leaders to really um, appreciate the gravity of the situation and raise their tone and their ambition because uh, they have to advocate for the populations who can be a leader and seeing the um, your population being, you know, year after year, victim of a situation that can be prevented. I think they can also take advantage of uh, an example, inspiration, on how the world responded to the crisis. I think the, 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 the pandemic has shown that if there is enough political will and ambition and, and action, um, no matter how the crisis uh, might be dramatic, there can be a way and a way forward. So if the, the same 
uh, level of energy, attention, and priority is also given uh, to climate change. I think we won't need to go to another 26 summit because this is the uh, 26 um, um, conference of parties. We wouldn't need uh, this um, um, numerous summit to act on a crisis which, uh, whose solution I already know. Indeed. So let's, let's focus on what African countries can do. Um, we need capital in order to essentially fund the domestic agenda on energy transitions, on forest conservation, on dealing with land degradation. What sources of domestic capital can African economies mm. tap into in order to deal with those needs? Mm. Well, I mean, contrary to the, some of the dominant narrative, Africa is not or as such as some people may tend to portray it. I think it's again um, an issue of looking at what we have already. Uh, what are our resources? What, are our, um, what can we get from the agriculture sector? What can we get from the forestry? What can we get also from the manuals? And most importantly, making sure that the, the local citizen, uh, local companies, businesses, and, and communities are prioritized. Because what has been happening in the last I think 15 years is that we have kind of handed, I mean, we as Africans, start the management of such businesses uh, to foreign companies who have been exploiting and take away that, that capital. So I think this is the time uh, to make some structural and fundamental reforms to the way our economies are, are structured and ensure that whatever benefit uh, we have on the ground benefit first to the to the people and the population in Africa and not those uh, foreign countries who have exploited and overexploited the resources of the continent. One last question for you. So coal, of course, is, is a pariah asset at the moment in international mm -hmm. finance. But as we move towards through this transition period, uh, the fact of the matter is that we do have a population that does need access to affordable energy and gas mm -hmm. is one of mm -hmm. providing that affordable energy. In your view, should gas essentially be treated in the same way that coal is at the moment, or should we approach it with a more nuanced, phased approach? So we say, let's give ourselves 10 years, uh, expand energy access, then after that, we can essentially now start to gate access to gas. Right. I think, first of all, uh, we have to make, I think, a distinction between um, the, some of the countries that have been historically responsible for emissions and, and Africa. Uh, at the same time, uh, that nuanced approach has to take into consideration also that uh, climate impact, human costs, and economic risk of new um, gas and oil projects mean that basically no fossil fuel should be exploited uh, on the continent in Africa and elsewhere. At the same time, there is a need for a gradual and equitable approach in um, you know, phasing out such, such um, um, kind of facility or in the gas industry. So at the same time, uh, countries need to look at uh, what is a realistic timeline to transition away from gas? Is, this is something that shouldn't happen overnight. Uh, for countries that are depending on that, uh, on that resource, they have to get the time to adjust because, again, this is an industry which is, uh, uh, on which um, you know, thousands, if not million people are dependent to and also are very important for the economy. But we know it's not um, a type of uh, um, um, energy source which is the one of the future. So it has to come to an end. However, it also needs a gradual uh, time and a managed uh, phase out uh, to be able to, uh, to achieve that just transition, which again may require a couple of years to happen. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Laundry Nintarat, Regional Director covering Africa at 350.org.